Harry Review. Awesome. What's going on, Eden? Welcome back to Harry Review. Today, we're with Saul and Queenie Naaman over here. And uh, we're looking forward to trying some barbecue herring. Saul is actually a Holocaust survivor, first Holocaust survivor on Hair and Review ever. And I'm really excited to hear your story and hear both of your stories, how you met, uh, all the insights I can learn from, from both of you. I'm really excited. This is going to be a good one. Well, so, that's wonderful. Welcome to Hair and Review. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with Hair and Review because I happen to love herring. Hmm. And yesterday, Shar Shemayim, I had a plate full of herring, but I don't expect that it was as good as the herring that we're having today. Was it barbecue herring? No, it was uh, hmm. plain, ordinary herring. Okay. With a lot of onion on it, and I don't touch onions. So really? Just had herring. Our herring is packed with onions. But Queenie's going to get rid of the onion for me. I'm, very, I'm a very particular person when it comes to what I consume. <laughs> It's beautiful to be with you, Jeremy. It's, and, it's uh, great to be here also. And thank you for bringing this wonderful stuff with us. Yeah, we got a little um, of time too. Um, oh, yeah, absolutely. On my last journey to Poland, I made sure I picked up some of the most famous Polish vodka, the mm. Chopin vodka. Mm. So, um, should we begin with the Lechaim? Sure, yeah. Okay, Lechaim. Lechaim. We're going to make a brach over here. Or if I thought an island, I'm going to make a Polish brach. Amen. And I'm Israel Chai. I'm Israel Chai. With mm -hmm. herring and with vodka. Mm -hmm. And we need, uh, we need to be able to share this with everyone. Look at the nice forks that Queenie wow. provided. Queenie, these are beautiful forks. Well. When did you get these forks? Oh, not to, a few years ago. Were they meant for herring? No, they've never well, been I used for herring. Well, I think they're designated but, for herring. Yeah, they're yeah. like the perfect they're herring They're from forks. South Africa. You know, in oh, some, really? in some mm -hmm. families, yeah. you might get uh, plastic forks mm -hmm. or wooden forks for herring from a real Polish survivor. It's got to be the best available mm -hmm. fork yeah. for the best available herring. Carol Boy's mm -hmm. forks from South Africa. Okay, that's okay. South African that's friend okay. who's, that's who's okay. supervising. <laughs> So, well, Jeremy, what can I tell you? Well, I want to hear about your life story. Well, my life story would take eight to eight years. Oh, eight. That's well, how old I, I don't am. Think, I don't think the camera battery will last that long. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, t tell me about where your parents were from. I was from the same place as my parents. Oh, uh, wow. A little shtetl in Poland called Stoczek Bangrowski, which was uh, 45 kilometers uh, south east of, uh, or southwest rather, no, southeast of Warsaw, for Warsaw was 45 kilometers southwest of our town, a very small town, which in 1939 had about 1,200 Jews. Today I happen to be the last Jew from our staple who has survived. Wow. Um, I was born in 1935, and uh, a few months before my turning four, uh, becoming four years old, our town was destroyed by the Nazis after they uh, after they launched their attack on Poland on September first. On September 9th, Stoczek ceased to exist, and we were very lucky that uh, uh, my father, my parents, my mother, my father, my sister, my grandmother, and I fled from our little town to the nearby forest, and Poland is famous for its forests. Many of the forests hid Jews for quite some time. Our family at that time was, my, uh, as I said, my parents, my sister, my sister Manya, who was eight years older than I, and the only grandparent I had was my maternal grandmother, Esther Doba. So we fled to this little, uh, to the forest from our little town, and from the distance I could see the town on fire, and the... And you were four? You were four at the time? Almost four. Wow. Um, I could see the town on fire, and later when I was 
looking for information about my town when I wrote a book about our survival, I found a photograph taken by a, a German Wehrmacht soldier, and that's the image that I've had all my life of our little stable on fire. Uh, my grandmother heard that the hospital, which was nothing more than another shack like ours, was on fire, so she decided to go back to see if she could help. Um, we waited and waited, and she had told us before we before she left, don't wait too long because you could be exposed. And uh, that was the last time we saw my grandmother. We were told to move on, otherwise we'd be discovered, and we somehow ended up in Bialystok, which was a hundred kilometers northeast of our state. Uh, Bialystok became a haven for those who try to flee from the Nazi occupation. Uh, before the war, Bialystok had about 50,000 Jews in its area. After the war, began, there were about 250,000 Jews who crammed into that little town to escape from the Nazis. Because Bialystok was part of northeast Poland that was occupied by the Soviets, part of the treaty that the Soviets arranged with uh, Hitler. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know what lay ahead of us. We knew that we were away from Nazi occupation. The premier of, Pol of uh, the Soviet Union, of Russia, <coughs> Joseph Stalin, who was arguably one of the worst mass murderers in history, realized that he had a ready-made slave labor population. So he deported us among 200,000 other Jews and quite almost as many Polish families to some of the slave labor camps throughout the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. We didn't know where we were going. We were packed into filthy old cattle cars. And uh, after a journey of many days or many weeks, I don't know how long it took, we ended up in Sikhtiv Kar in the Komi Republic of the Soviet Union. So I don't want to cut you off, but is sure. there any way we can have like a fan or something? Some there? I've got it. Yeah, it's really sweaty. Yeah. It's crazy to me that you remember all this, because I don't even think I have any memories of when I was Wait, that young. I just turned the air conditioning down. Let me turn it off. Thank you. Today's maybe the hottest day of the year. Yeah. It is. In, in Toronto yeah. right now. Yeah. 30 degrees. Oh, that's good. You can feel the cool air yeah. coming up. Yeah. You're going to be okay there, Roger? You're going to... Are you okay? You're sitting right on top of the register. I'm great. You're great. Okay. So your your first memories that you have like were pretty traumatic. The memories that I had are traumatic, but they're also memories of love for my mother, my grandmother, uh, my sister, my father. My sister used to read to me in Polish and Yiddish. Uh, Erev Shabbat, my sister and I would bring our pot of chulnt to the local baker and the chulnt would be simmered overnight and after shul and Shabbat we would have a warm meal of chulnt. Hmm. Uh, my father had gone through the yeshiva system, etc., etc., but he abandoned our religion. He went off the dera. He went off the dera because he aligned himself with what became very fashionable for young people at that time, the left of center um, parties. So he joined the Bund. So he absolutely moved away from Judaism, from our religion. Mm. But my mother, my grandmother, Shabbat candles, Shabbat meal. The same baker who baked, uh, the same baker who took care of our chum was also the one who provided matzahs for Pesach. That was before, before strikes, before 
Manu Shepherds before Yehuda Matzos. Mm. Um, my sister and I would go to the bakery, pick up our order of matzahs, and wrap them in a beautiful white tablecloth and put them away until Seder time. Before the Seder, the community would have a community burning of the Hamas. It was yeah. everyone we still do it. was together. It was yeah. all together at that time. Mm. Interestingly, while my father did not attend shul, I went to shul every Shabbos, even though at that age I didn't know anything about the Tfilot. But I used to watch the men sitting and shuffling. And, and how, how old were you at this time? Uh, three, three and a half. Wow. Damn. You have the best memory of, I've ever heard of in my life. Well, I had the privilege of telling my story a few times, so <laughs> I do remember some parts of it. And the reason I used to sit in Shoko, of course I would sit on the bima or near the bima, because at the end of davening, the rabbi would give me a treat, a candy mm -hmm. for a treat. I would we have all the same traditions. All the yeah, same traditions. Candy man has been here since World War II. So I had a, I would say a happy childhood because I was surrounded by a loving family. Mm. We were very poor, like everyone in town was. Our house was like all the others, a wooden shack uh, without any facilities, any modern facilities. The town didn't even have a paved road. It had mud, but wow. it was okay. Mondays, market days were very busy. My grandmother had a little food store in front of our little shack <laughs> selling various products that she would bring in from Warsaw. Mm. And the Polish people from the surrounding villages would come to barter, buy, sell, trade. The only possession that I had was a hand-me-down white rocking horse. And of course, in the summertime, I would sit in front of my grandmother's uh, food counter. I would sit and rock on that white rocking horse. And when it was hot, I would bring my grandmother's milk measuring quart. That's what it was called, a quart. Mm -hmm. It's actually a quart, but in Yiddish it was a quart. And I would fill it with water and give it to my horse when it was hot. So that wow. my horse would have enough energy to yeah. keep on rocking with me. Yeah. On a day like today, the horse would need a lot on of milk. On a day like today, the horse would re need more than one measure of water. Did you name the horses? It's interesting. Somebody else asked me the name of the horse. I don't know. It. Probably Ferdl. You know, Ferdl is Yiddish for a horse, so a Ferdl is a small horse. Maybe even Ferdl, which is even smaller. Huh. Yiddish has various diminutives, like a bull, a Ferdl, a Ferdl, a Berdichke. Everything had its range of up Do you or speak down. Yiddish? No, not, not a lot. I know a little bit. I know Ichas Herring and Ichnem videos, which means I eat herring and I make videos. <laughs> uh, at any rate, uh, we, I mentioned a few minutes ago that we ended up in the Komi Republic mm. of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. So under Russian control? Under control of the Soviet yes. Union. At that time, uh, the Soviet Republic consisted of about 16 different so-called autonomous republics. There was nothing autonomous about them, like Estonia, Latvia, Ukraine, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. We were shipped to build barracks. My father, who didn't have any work skills, suddenly became a glazer. What's a glazer? A glazer is a person who cuts the glass for the building, for the yeah. barracks. Oh. Um, mm -hmm. It was brutal. We were crammed into a tiny little room in, in a barrack that had absolutely no amenities, no electricity, no heat, not even a floor. It was basically mud covered up with some planks. Um, and the weather in Siftakar when we arrived at the end of, towards the end of 19, 
39 was brutal. Uh, in the winter time, uh, temperatures could drop to minus 50 degrees. Yeah. We were crammed into this one little room with another family, another couple, the Mita family. Um, the barracks were horrible. They had a long corridor in which those who did not have a family, who did not have a room, would sit there, would s they'd be squatters. One day my father walked through the corridor and started up a conversation with a young man who turned out to be his nephew, my cousin Moshe. Moshe, also Moshe Naiman, as it was pronounced in those days. Mm -hmm. So Moshe joined our family and Moshe was crammed into our little room with all the others. And we went through this day after day, week after week, in absolute horrible conditions. The only difference between being in one of these slave labor camps and perhaps a death camp or a concentration camp in Poland or anywhere in Europe is that we were not under Nazi control or Nazi occupation. The Soviets basically didn't bother us so long as work was being done. But you were like a like you were like five. So what work could you do in a lab in a labor camp? Well, my father was working on a building project, mm -hmm. as was Moshe, as were many others. And there's an old Russian saying, "Ktonya rabotayet onya kushayet." He who doesn't work does not eat. Mm -hmm. So those who worked, like my father and Moshe, were given uh, coupons for food. Mm -hmm. Food was a piece of horrible bread. Sometimes there was a little piece of chicken, mm -hmm. rotten potatoes. But we managed to get through. The worst thing was winter time, because we had no proper clothing. We had no shoes. The most important thing was footwear. And people were dying from different diseases and from starvation and from the horrible winter weather and horrible summer heat. And the first thing people would try to do when they find a corpse on the street, and there were many corpses at times, is their shoes. Shoes were the most important thing that people could have. At any rate, uh, Moisha was sort of the go-getter in the family. And one day he took the only possession that we had from Poland, my parents' wedding silver spoons and forks, silver. And Moshe tried to trade them on the black market and he was able to get for the fragile silver pieces, a little five ruble, 22 karat Russian gold coin from the Tsarist era. Anyone caught with one of those coins would be finished. So that little coin was sewn into the garment that I was wearing. I oh, didn't wow. know about that because I was so curious I would have done something about it. So you, you were like a little secret agent. Mm-hmm. Like, got it. Talking too much. Hmm? Faster than talking too much. I don't talk fast. <laughs> You're talking too much. Okay. Maybe you could leave out like some details. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Well, we... Uh, so right now we're in the middle of the war in the... In the middle of the war. In the labor camp. The commie, uh, sir. My father is working on a project. When Hitler broke his treaty with Stalin in June 1941 and invaded the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. Operation uh, Barbarossa. Barbarossa. Barbarossa, exactly. Stalin declared a scorched earth policy in Ukraine before Hitler invaded Ukraine. Everything in Ukraine was to be destroyed. All the wheat fields, all the beet fields, all the... Was Ukraine under Nazi rule? No, Ukraine was part of the Soviet oh. Republic system. But when Stalin's, when the 
German armies after they invaded Belarus and were heading to Ukraine, everything was to be destroyed so that the Nazis could not take advantage uh -huh. of anything. The Nazis actually came within 50 kilometers of the Kremlin in Moscow, but they were, they didn't really learn the lesson from Napoleon. It was fall of 1941 and a brutal winter set in and they couldn't, they couldn't do anything. They didn't have any garments, they didn't have proper things, so Moscow was saved. And then the same thing happened in Stalingrad, same, uh, which again, the Nazis tried to occupy. Long story short, the Soviet army at huge cost were repelled the Nazis from Ukraine, from Belarus. So we were shipped to the Ukraine to rebuild a factory there. Hmm. Conditions were a little bit better. We were in a better, uh, better place to live in. We had a wonderful Ukrainian neighbors who were very kind, very generous to us. They had a farm with things that they shared with us. My mother, unfortunately, was very, very ill most of her life. And we, I have to say that if it were not for the Ukrainian family, the Mogila family, my mother would not have survived much longer. Wow. Well, Chaim to the Mogila family. And there's, Chaim is right. And as it's been said by many Holocaust survivors, no one survived the war without the help of someone else. Mm. And the Mogila family helped us. Wow. The war ended um, in May 1945, and we had a choice to remain in the Soviet Union and become Soviet citizens or left mm. We chose to leave. We ended up after many weeks of travel under the auspices of the United Nations Refugee Relief Association in West Germany in 19, from 1945 to 1948. We were in Wetzlar near Frankfurt in West Germany, which was under the American, uh, American control. And we were able to get to Canada. The only way we could get to Canada was by Moishe's very, very aggressive pleading with the uh, immigration people. My sister and I and Moshe could go. My parents couldn't because my mother's poor health. And the other choices, there were no other choices. Going to Palestine become, before it became Israel was a no-no. Were you, was your family Zionistic growing up? Like, did you know about, like, the Jews going to Palestine? Well, we knew because we had, uh, my mother had a cousin in Tel Aviv. She uh, mm -hmm. left there in, 19, uh, in 1932. Mm -hmm. uh, many other members of the family, my mother's cousins particularly, they, they were five girls. They left Poland in the late 20s, early 30s, to <coughs> Argentina, Mexico, uh, Sao Paulo, and the U.S., but we couldn't get a visa to any of those places. Hmm. And again, we were told that if Manya and Moshe were married, it might help. So they got a, married, a fake marriage certificate. Nobody had any papers. Nobody knew anything in those days. That didn't help. And by the way, that was the first time that we learned about what happened during the Holocaust, because in the Soviet Union there was no. absolutely no word at all. And what year was this? This was 1945 to 1948. Wow. We knew nothing. We met survivors from the camps for the first time, from Auschwitz, from uh, other places. We saw their emaciated bodies. We saw the tattoos on their arms. So we felt very, very lucky that we didn't have to endure what they did in 
<coughs> for many, many years, I didn't concern myself to be a Holocaust survivor because we did not have to go through what what so many, so many others did. At any rate, we still don't have a visa. Then we learned that Canada was looking for tailors for the growing uh, garment industry in Winnipeg. My father didn't know one end of the needle from another, but we had a cousin who was a master tailor, so he passed the test for us again. There were no documents, there were no papers in those days. It still didn't help. So Moshe remembered, of course, that little 22 carat five ruble gold coin. And he approached the immigration official with a little gift, that little coin. And that little coin, that little golden coin, got us a passport to this golden land. Wow. So in October 1948, we left Wetzlar on nine day crossing of the Atlantic to Halifax and uh, Ere of Shabbat, October 16, 1948, we arrived in Canada. And the rest is history. Wow. <laughs> so you said that for a while you didn't consider yourself a Holocaust survivor. What made you start to consider yourself a Holocaust survivor? When I met others who had similar experiences to what we did, but the real revelation, so to speak, was about 15 years ago. A little longer. Yeah. Queenie and I are a little longer. We were in Washington, and of course we decided to visit the U.S. Holocaust Museum in Washington. And whenever I would be in a museum, whether it was uh, Yad Vashem or anywhere else, I always try to find out what is there about our staple. <clears throat> and they showed us a memorial book which was written by those who survived and those who left earlier. And I said, oh, thank you, I have that. Um, and they wanted my name and entered my name in, the, in their database. And they said, why aren't you registered as a survivor? I said, because I don't consider myself to be a survivor. And I told them why. So they shared with me the definition of a survivor, which basically is <coughs> all those who were displaced from their homes, from their cities, from their countries from 1933, when Hitler came to power, to 1945, when the war ended. Mm -hmm. So I was told I'm a survivor. So I accepted that role of a survivor. And uh, the first thing I did shortly after that, which is not really the first thing that I did, I had to share that with my family, with friends. Even my family didn't know much about it. I didn't talk about it at family gatherings. But I decided in uh, 19, in 2013, 75, 35 plus 75. 35 to 75 is 2010 to write my story, which basically is Zadie's story, which I dedicated to the five grandchildren that we have at that time. And, uh, and the first thing that happened was our twins decided to go on the March of Living in 2012. And I wanted to go with them. They said, no, Zadie, you can't come with us. You're too emotional. And then when our grandson Maurice, Moshe Baruch, decided to go in 2016, I said, Moshe, I'm going with you. And I'll emote if I emote. If I don't, I don't. And that was an incredible experience. It was the first time that I was back in Poland since 1939. It was the first time that I was back in Treblinka, which was our neighbor of death camp. Treblinka is 20 kilometers from our shtetl. Mm -hmm. And since then, I've been speaking at every possible opportunity, schools, shuls, churches, 
The the work. The work. The work. The work. The work. And uh, in 2022, uh, 23 rather, last year, I returned to my stable for the first time since 1939. Wow. And it was what's it like now? To be able to do that, because to deviate from any of the planned <laughs> trips by the March of Living is very, very difficult. Oh, damn. But with the help of the March of Living organization, the Johnny Daniels, and Ivan Diamond, and Ivan Diamond, we were <laughs> able to deviate from our direct trip to Treblinka. It was Warsaw to Cochin, Lupo Hotors, Treblinka, and then back to Warsaw. We did a little detour. And not only was I there with four survivors, 124 students, 20 chaperones, four staff people, two rabbis, but our dear friend Ivan Diamond, who flew in to Stocek to be with us and to video my speaking at Stocek, <laughs> which we was able to watch. And um, Ivan. And that was one of the most amazing experiences of my life, and one of the most very amazing experiences of the March of Living. So after the Holocaust, religious life was kind of on a down low because a lot of Jews were kind of questioning what the heck just happened. And the one who's kind of credited with reviving Judaism was a Lubavitcher Rebbe. And I'm wondering, what was your first like time you ever heard about the Rebbe? I don't know when was the first time I heard about the Rebbe, but the first thing that I did when we got to uh, Wetzlar is I enrolled, actually before that, we were in a little Polish town near Waldenberg, or Waldjuk in Polish, which was at that time under the Soviet control. Germany was split into four parts under Soviet, U.S., British, and French control. This place was under Soviet control, but we were given a very outstanding dwelling. It was wonderful. And I was told that there was a Haida and a Malamud who was very nice. He'd give his children, whoever would be there, treats. <laughs> For treats, I'd go anywhere. See, so, <laughs> for the first time, I learned a few tefillot, because I didn't learn them at home. Mm -hmm. At any rate, one evening we were sitting down for dinner. Oh, and I was also given a talit katan and a kippah, and we sat down for a bite of supper, and I decided to recite hamotzi. <laughs> And after I recited Hamotzi, my father gave me a whack on the side of the head because he didn't believe in that. Mm -hmm. My mother, of course, sided with me. And I think that was one of the first sparks for me to get into Judaism. Mm -hmm. Then in Wetzla, I enrolled in a school. Uh, which was at that time organized for to teach Hebrew. And uh, uh, I, I learned Hebrew, I learned prayers, I became fluent in Hebrew. And when we arrived in Canada, when we ended up in Montreal, I enrolled in the Talmud Torah, which again gave me an opportunity to learn whatever I could. We also arrived uh, when we arrived in Montreal, it was era of Sukkot, and shortly afterwards, I was supposed to have my bar mitzvah, but I hadn't learned any of the brachot. I didn't learn the Torah. It was left lecha. My uncle in New York sent me a talit, sent me to Berlin, etc., etc. But I didn't have time to learn whatever I needed to know. 
So I didn't have a bar mitzvah uh -huh. until 75 years, 75 or 80 years. 80 or 70, at 80 1980, years. We got the fact 75, right 75. Yeah. So 75 years later, on Shabbat Lechlecha, at Shar in the presence of our dear friend Ivan and other several other chaperones, a lot of chaperones, <laughs> and uh, I did a very good job of of the uh, Torah. Shalom, Adam, Yaakov. Oh wow! Okay. Are you saying all this? Israel, okay. Nistara. One thing I'm I have to do. One thing. The one thing I planned for bar mitzvah it was Queenie's party for Saul. But the one thing Saul insisted upon with the caterer was a herring table. Oh, oh wow. That's important. We had the magnificent herring table. Left Lecha, November 2025. We're booking a schmuck herring that's now. That's right. Okay, that's right. Yeah. That's right. We'll come back from Israel. Oh, that's right. Well, we're booking a schmuck herring. <laughs> yeah. So the herring yes. table for uh, the 90th birthday. Okay, you got it. I, I don't know when I became aware of the Rebbe. Mm -hmm. And of course, the marvelous Chabad movement. Some of our friends were Chabadniks. I read as much as I could about the Rebbe, his wonderful, wonderful background, the fact that he was not just a, a religious Jew, he was a wonderful human being involved in so many other things besides. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, his love of Judaism, and it so happens that our eldest son um, is a member of Chabad Flamingo. Oh wow! And uh, Rabbi uh, Kaplan. Rabbi Kaplan is one of the best known. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chabad I've Rabbi. seen his videos on YouTube before. Yeah. So um, I love the opportunity to, to be at Chabad Flamingo. Um, when people ask me, what do I do? I daven three times a day. I work out two or three times a day. I eat usually twice two or, a day. Two or three workouts a day? Yeah. Yeah. Well, short ones, short ones. Okay. Pilates, yoga, uh, all kinds of different yeah. moves. Um, when I play golf, or I walk, which is about a five, six mile walk. Wow. And our course will be available shortly, Ivan. You can tell your dad that the day is the day is coming. Oh, the now that are flooded. Oh, I'm, all, I'm looking forward to playing there. That'll be that'll be super fun. Jeremy will go with you. Yeah, we'll get like we'll bring some Harry. So <laughs> <laughs> at Denalda, Harry at Denalda. We'll bring Harry sure. anywhere. Well, I, I don't think it would quite fit. <laughs> <laughs> you don't do a Harry table at Denalda. <laughs> So one question I love asking people who were born before 1948 was, what was it like the first time you went to Israel? What was the feeling? Uh, before that, on May 14, 1948, I'm in school, Beit Sefer Tavut, and the teacher tells us that this afternoon we'll be listening to something very special. We're told to gather around the his desk, etc., and we were listening to a shortwave radio of Ben Gurion proclaiming the state of Israel. Wow! And that Kabbalat Shabbat, that explosion of joy on May 14, 1948, was absolutely amazing. I couldn't quite process what. What does it mean at the age of 13, we have a country, we have a homeland? Mm -hmm. But it was one of the most memorable moments of my life. Wow. Until I went to Israel for the 1977. first time. 1977. 1977. And a dear friend of ours who lived right behind us said, how would you like to go to the Maccabiah Games and be the official photographer? Of course, he knew I loved cameras, etc. Et <laughs> so, July 4th, 1977, I flew to Israel for the first time, and it was uh, incredible. 
A, to be able to be the photographer of not only the athletes, but Golda Meir and uh, all the officials. And we have three then, uh, oh. It was an incredible awesome. experience. And after that, I've been back many times. And with the March of Living and the H Living Legacy, seven times, mm. officially. And before that, with my family, with our children. And in my previous business life, when I was running Club Monaco, mm -hmm. we opened a Club Monaco store. How many did you have? Two or three? Just the one. Just the one. Just the one. So mm -hmm. that brought me to Israel many times. Wow. And uh, God willing, I'll be there again next year, yes. twice. Once with the March of Living, second time with. You won't Asian be in Israel. You will, you'll only be in Poland with Aish, not to, not in Israel. No, of course. And, and Unless Mashiach comes. <laughs> and there's another journey with Aish this fall, which I uh, we have some pre prior commitments, so I don't know if that will happen. But mm. the joy of being in on the March of Living this past year was that Ivan organized this wonderful, wonderful journey with university students who missed the march yeah. during COVID. Mm -hmm. And uh, my arm is still twisted because I always go with the 17 year olds, but Ivan twisted my arm to spend at least the majority of the time with the university students. And it was just wonderful, mm -hmm. just absolutely great. Yeah. So if Ivan does anything like that again, I think he may want to twist my left arm this time mm -hmm. to see if we can do it. So I'm getting a bit hungry. And we should eat some herring. Yeah. Yeah? Okay. Okay. So the herring we're having today is the Gishmak herring barbecue herring over here. Oh, are we going for round two right now? You're still, you're still uh, taping or are we done? No, we're still taping. Of course. Oh, okay. So yeah, yeah. <laughs> we have to have a little more vodka. Queenie, you pour, darling, because you do it so much better. Uh -huh. How did you and Queenie meet each other? Oh, that's a long it's story. A long story. Can we get like a quick version first? There's no quick version. Oh, damn. First, Ms. Oinus. There's no 100%. quick version, so uh, we'll oh, just no, have to... Oh, no, I'm name is enough. We'll just have to uh, wing it. We met. We met. We got married three years later. Hmm. And we've been married for almost 63 years. I'll let you open that. In those 63 years, how many times do you think you've heard Saul's story? <laughs> Enough when he's, when he's reading it or whatever, I correct. <laughs> wow. Well, my story is a long story. Here, let me open this. Give me that plate, honey. But the important, the most important thing that I emphasize about our story is that surviving in the Soviet Union was really quite dramatic. And the fact is that two and a half million Jews were slaughtered in the Soviet Union, which is not very well known mm. and is not talked about very much. Mm. Two and a half million. Oh, wow. About the six million in the Soviet Union. And um, it's often been called, it was the, the Holocaust by bullets, and in Poland and other parts it was the Holocaust See, by gas. See how good I am to him? I think. Yeah. I think I'm coming in for the herring. Oh, for, for sure, for sure, sure the herring. Get okay. him in here. Mm -hmm. You're going to give an onion one free to Ivan too? Do you like onions? I, I'll, I'll could do some. I can do an, an empty glass there. Sure, so why not? So you want onions? Okay. Yeah, sure. I know. So, I'll go go get another plate like this, please, from the cover. So ch Japan vodka, direct from Poland. Yeah. yeah. yeah do you want to give this? Well, I remember you said something sure. about chocolate vodka. Uh, we we had it we had it in, we had it in Warsaw. Queen, are you gonna have some herring too? 
Uh, maybe I'll have the onions. <laughs> okay, so the onions? The onions are delicious. <laughs> and the Kishma yeah. Caring Harry is packed with onions, too. Yeah, I know. Mm-hmm. What other flavors do they make? That's a great question. We make honey dish, chipotle mayo, and OG schmaltz. Mm-hmm. Not to be confused with regular schmaltz. I don't know if I could... Uh, the only herring I like is the one that comes in the jars, you know, the little... The little uh, packed in uh, the feature foods pairing in yeah. the glass jars. Yeah, but I don't like feature. I mean, I like Mrs. White's or any of the other ones that come from. Uh, I don't know if I've tried Mrs. White's. And what you're doing is beautiful. Oh, thank you. Good. And thank you for digging me out. Yeah, I, I, I go. I go with the uh, with the ones that come from Quebec because my aunt married into that the family that does all that. Oh, for so sure. I'm loyal. Some herring royalty in the family. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, give it to us all. Look, look, look how so wait for. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, hold on, wait, wait for Queen. After two years, I still get this. Kind I'm of just treatment. gonna have onions. Wow. Mm. I don't think I want the herring. What an amazing wife. Oh, you're already going at it. I'm so it doesn't wait. So, so I actually make a shahako before I eat the herring, even if it's with the mazonos, because the herring is the ichor. Like that's what I say, but it's a okay, up so to debate. I can't keep up <laughs> with you. I don't know for long. Should I call maybe Burrow? I'm surprised that there isn't a special guapa for herring. Mm. It's such an integral part. They should add one. Judaism, there should be one. Yeah. I so wonder how we make that happen. Who do we have to contact? We're going to some some rabbis. Yeah. When the Mashiach comes, yeah, so the, the first time. thing. Lachaim, Lachaim. Lachaim, Lachaim. To the Yidin and to the Mashiach. Am Yisrael Chai. Am Yisrael Chai. What's this chocolate? How are the onions, Queenie? Delicious. Glad you're enjoying them. So, Saul, when October 7th happened, were you, like, how, what was your reaction to see something like that happen to Jewish people again? Were you was, surprised at all, or? It was absolutely horrifying. Surprised to a degree. Surprised that it happened when it could have been prevented. Mm. Yeah. Surprised, not surprised at all that Hamas or the axis of evil, which is Iran's group, Mm-hmm. Not surprised at all that something would happen I didn't at some point. Well, you gotta have some more. Well, were but surprised and disappointed that a lot of the intelligence <laughs> the that was shared with the Israeli, the Shin Bet, with Mossad, etc., etc., did not compel Israel to do something about yeah. ensuring that nothing could come, nothing like that could come from Gaza. Sure, the, the, the rockets, the this, the that. It was known that the tens of thousands of Gaza residents were working in Israel, mm-hmm. coming in, going back. It was known that they knew all the kibbutzim Mm-hmm. back and forth. It was known that there was some preparation about a potential attack and nothing seemed to have been done about that and that to me is a horrible, horrible disappointment yeah. of those who knew better and of the government who didn't do what could have been done Mm-hmm. Maybe not to prevent the total uh, the attack, but it could have prevented some of the killings. It could have prevented some of the hostage taking because it was known that the most important asset that the Jew haters, the Hamas, and others, their most important asset is a hostage, and we had gone through that with Shalit and others, it was known that they had to protect 
the kibbutzim. Yeah, it's so tragic. And terribly, terribly tragic, terribly mm -hmm. tragic. And to see it continuing uh, 10 months later, to see what's happening with Hezbollah in Lebanon, to the see to uh, yesterday uh, an attack from Hezbollah tragic. that killed 12 children and mm -hmm. injured dozens of others. And what is the world saying about it? Israel deserves it because Israel has occupied the Golan, etc., etc., etc. That's crazy. Israel sent a delegation to the funeral and they were asked to leave. Smotrich, for example. He was told to get out by the by the Druze officials. And I believe that there's such love between the Jews and the Druze. Many served I in the IDF, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. But I do not support the ultra right wing people like Smotrich and Ben Gvir and others. I don't think they're doing Israel any good in Israel and certainly internationally. And I, I, I avoid getting into politics. I love Israel, I love Zionism, I love Judaism, but there is a problem. And I think the vast majority of Israelis recognize that as a problem. Yeah. And will that be looked after? Will that be corrected? In like the next like hours? If it's, no. It's no, all on the no, table. No, no. So tell me, where does one buy this herring? Hmm? Well, like I know Saul loves it, so mm -hmm. he'll eat the herring, I'll eat the onions. Perfect. Perfect relationship. So you can buy it on newagefish.com. Mm -hmm. No stores carry it? No stores carry it yet, maybe. I don't know. But if you order it tomorrow, if you're watching this tomorrow, it's free, free delivery charge. Yeah, just a little compelling offer for the inn. Queenie, what was the first time you had herring? In your life? I don't think I ever remember a time when I didn't have hair. Oh. I I also, I'll have some without the uh, without the tam tam. I was in Canada during the war. Mm -hmm. I was never <clears throat> deprived of anything. I was never. Uh, my father was was butcher, so we had food. Cook. We never had to worry. Show pet. No, no, no. He, no. It's and the butcher. Just a butcher. I was a show of it. Wow. Hold it straight, honey. And we never, like, we never had, uh, yes, there was rationing and everything before my father, because my father was in the food industry, mm -hmm. we had everything we needed. So if there was herring around, uh, we ate herring. And because I, I mentioned earlier that my, you know, my aunt's family were in the, uh, they made pickles, they made herring, they made all that, so we, you know, we had all that. Yeah. Uh, so I don't think there was ever a time that I didn't have herring. My grandmother used to make it, my mother used to make it. But it was always the same thing. It was always like with very, you know, what? Sort and of when I said I, when I said I was a show, but in the Ukraine, the Mogila, Mr. Mogila, mm -hmm showed me how to slaughter a chicken. But weren't they non-Jewish? Well, they were forced, they were Ukrainian. And I, I learned how to do it, and on occasion, when somebody would have a chicken, they wouldn't know what to do with it, so they, I told them I could handle it. I would wow. turn its, I would turn and its- It's a whole meal. Yeah, I would turn its neck back, I would pluck the feathers, and I had a razor blade. Uh, so please. Oh, it's getting graphic on hair review. Please. Might have to censor that part. Please, please, please. We so, don't need. And I did it because I would then get a piece of the chicken. Hmm. No kibble too. You're going without the kibble. Hmm. <laughs> now, what are the what are the, the other flavors? There's so there's honey Dijon, um, OG schmaltz, and chipotle mayo. So the honey Dijon and the Chipotle mayo are creamy, and then the schmaltz is like another one like this. I don't know if I would like the uh, 
I think Chipotle is. Oh, really? No. Yeah. Yeah, I don't like spicy. Mm -hmm. That's so fair. But you know what, Saul, if you want, I'll order some for you. I have another question, Saul. When you were growing up and you were in the war and stuff, did you know that there were Jews in, like, um, in the Middle East and, like, in Arab countries, too, at the time? Saul? Saul? Oh. I think. You might as well finish. What was it like the first time meeting a Mizrahi Jew? Well, it didn't happen until Canada, hmm. because in Europe, the Europe that we went through, there were no Mizrahi Jews there. Uh, it was all Ashkenazi. Hmm. Um, of course, in Israel, I met many Mizrahi Jews, and um, in Toronto, um, I don't, I don't remember when or where or how. I think the first Mizrahi Jew I ever met were the Daniels family. Ariella Daniels and no, <laughs> Queen. Who else? Who Before else? Ariella, we had a daughter-in-law in our family. Nicole. Mor Moroccans are, are, are Mizrahi? Of course. Mm. Yeah, Sephardi Mizrahi. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. Oh, so that means your kid had a henna. Yeah. Oh, wow. That must be fun. That was our, hennas are awesome. Our friends had the best time because they had never been to one before. Wow. They had the best, best, yeah. best time. Yeah, we hadn't been to one before either. Yes, we had. I think even if I don't marry oh, a Moroccan, yes, yes. I'll still have a henna. Just because you're so cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we have a friend. We have a friend who's who was uh, Moroccan, and uh, I believe you've got to have some herring. I've had some salt. <laughs> okay, I think the herring's all gone. Oh wow! There's just onions. Mm. And of course, uh, working with some Mizrahi Jews. In yeah, connection with the Aish is just a wonderful experience. Mm -hmm. um, Saul, give me a plate. I thought you said that we're done. Saul's so being forced fed air. There's, I'm digging it all out. <laughs> Saul, so what's a message you, you have for all the Yiddin, young Jews out there? That are struggling with being Jewish. Give me, give me a plate, so. The non-Jews or no, like young Jews who are struggling in universities because mm -hmm. marry Jewish. Marry, marry Jewish. Jewish, yeah, that's mm -hmm. it. I agree. Whenever we're in Warsaw, we go to the Nozick Synagogue, which is the longest-standing synagogue in in Poland or in Warsaw, I should say. Except this year, the rabbi was out of town. There was a substitute rabbi. But Rabbi Shudrith, who is the chief rabbi of Poland, of course, is the rabbi who officiates at Noshik on Shabbat. And his drasha, he said, always says the same thing. My drasha only consists, consists only of two words, marry Jewish. That's his whole drasha on Shabbat. Yeah. And he wasn't there to do it this year, but we had a rabbi who kept talking endlessly. <laughs> Did he say the same thing? What year? Did he say marry Jewish? Mm -mm. No. Do you have any dating advice for me? Because I have to marry Jewish one day. Dating advice? Yeah. Or marriage advice? You know, there's... Um, Find a nice we are Jewish talking. girl. We are t there's a saying, say umad, go and learn. Hmm. Now, I'm sure you've done your learning in terms of Torah, Mitzvot, etc., etc. Go where you'll find Jewish young women. Well, hmm. you're making Aliyah, so. Make I got some Jewish man. You're going to meet Jewish girls. You'll meet Jewish girls. Hmm. Go on the march, you'll meet Jewish girls go to whatever go on the Asian there were actually there were a few uh, few young women on the Asian trip oh yeah who were looking for a shidduch any of them like Aaron? and there were Aaron? 
Do any of them like Harry? <laughs> we didn't get that far. And there were two married couples and yeah. one that's getting married. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that's, that's the environment. Mm. That's the environment. And you don't have to bring herring for them. Really? Did they have herring in, in did they serve herring anywhere in Poland? <laughs> every every I hotel. Didn't. I mean, in Israel, breakfast, hmm. 18 varieties of herring. Baruch Hashem. And imagine having herring and then dates. Hmm. How did, how did you get into this thing? Well, I always loved herring my whole life because my mom's South African, so we grew up like having herring, chopped herring, and then I started Gishmak herring because I was bored in COVID. I just got back from yeshiva, uh -huh. and I, I'd always liked making videos, so I made these videos where I would review herring, and my friends were like, this is funny, so I just <laughs> kept making them, and then more people followed, and then now we make our own herring. Now, is this your company, or is it your... So it's like a partnership between Gishmak herring and New Age Fish. New Age Fish, they make the herring, like they're, they're wizards, they're really good at it, but I, I, can, I come up with the flavors and I uh, film videos and do some promotion for it. Beautiful, this is beautiful, yeah. beautiful. Well, when I find my Jewish wife, I hope she will serve me herring, like you. <laughs> and you know what? Just to be clear, having a Jewish wife is even more important than having herring. <laughs> I have a Jewish wife who has never served me herring. Uh, well, I should never say. Say. No, my no, mother, my mother once cut up some herring. Yeah. yeah. When we were first married, we went for a walk with my parents, and we passed a store that had barrels in the window, and my, mother, my father's eyes lit up. Yeah. And I said, what's this all about? And, oh, I want herring. I said, not in my house. And my mother said, it's okay, honey, I'll, I'll do it. Open and in there. New York, of course, when we were in New York. And oh, but that was not, that, that's, that's, uh, that, that's not Harry. Henry. That's no, not I'm not show. talking about, I think I mentioned to you that uh, very I famous restaurant, uh, Aquabit. They serve about 20 different varieties. Yeah, we see that's the kind, I, I like that kind of herring because it's not all yeah. oily and... Uh, Aquavit, oh, okay. Aquavit serves about 20 different varieties. Where's that Aquavit? Where is it? In, New York. in, in, in Manhattan. Manhattan. Huh. And after each serving of herring, you have to have a shop. Sounds like my kind of place. <laughs> and uh, Aquavit is one of the liqueurs, one of the whiskies that are famous in Sweden. Mm -hmm. Alrighty, Saul, Queenie, thank you so much. Well, we we can end the video here. Yeah. So well, I, just, awesome. I need you. a phone number or, um, or I, I need a website. Mm -hmm. Sure, we don't do a rating? Well, no. it's like a 10 out of 10 because it's Kishmak Aaron. Like, huh. <laughs> yeah, right. what, what you Salt was a 10 out of 10, 10 correct? Of 10 but herring. you don't do a, like a, a, a pickled herring in white wine sauce? No, that's not yet. That's what I'm using. They actually, they call that women's herring. That's that's yeah. the kind of herring. No, I also but I don't, I don't like the feature, so like I don't yeah, I mean, used no. to buy herring for yantan and stuff, but I don't because I don't like feature herring. It's oh. too, it's just, I don't know. This is a fun, fun, this is fun. event, Jeremy. Yeah. Thank this you for fun. the herring. No Thank problem. you for getting me to ramble on about my story. <laughs> it's so fascinating. Well. Um, and when do you leave? Soon. August 27th. That's our anniversary. Wow. Yeah, it's on a Tuesday. Apparently, I learned that good. it's good to do stuff on Tuesday. Is it? Yeah, apparently. Just like good luck and stuff. So next time we're in Israel, uh, you'll have a plate of yeah. herring ready. 100%. I'll even bring you a... I'll even bring Will you, you serve it to me? Well, yeah, I'll okay. serve it to you. Okay. Looking forward. Alrighty, we'll end it right here. And little the Carol boys know that her her forks will become carrying forks. <laughs>